So good afternoon, everyone, if you want to gather seats. Um, thank you for joining us on our second lunchtime expedition talk of 2020. Uh, just a couple quick announcements. Please silence or turn off your electronic devices uh, so they don't go off in the middle of the presentation. Um, we also want to take a minute to thank our sponsors, the Nancy Carroll Draper Charitable Foundation, as well as Sage Creek Ranch, for making all of these talks possible. Um, you know, we're really excited about the lineup that we have this year, which includes a diverse pool of speakers spanning county, state, federal, and nonprofit entities. Um, these lectures are being recorded and are being uploaded to our YouTube channel. So if you go to youtube.com and search Draper Natural History Museum, you'll pull up all of our lectures from 2018, 2019, and now 2020. Um, also, if you'd like to be added to our email distribution list, just flag me down. I'll come around with a clipboard. We'll get your name and we'll get your email and then you'll get the announcements a week before the talk as well as the day of and links to previous presentations. So another good reason to sign up. Um, so today we're going to hear from Mr. Brian Bovet, curator of the Park County Archives here in Cody. Bovet holds a master's degree in history and is currently working towards a master of library science degree. Bovet is also a member of the Park County Historic Preservation Commission which seeks to identify and nominate sites to the National Register of Historic Places. Beauvais is a meticulous researcher whose keen attention to detail and interest in local history often involves sifting through archival records and periodicals, which at times comprise the only known record or documentation of past events. More than a job, Beauvais's passion frequently involves boots on the ground reconnaissance to explore and validate many of these difficult to access historical sites throughout Park County. So every story has an origin and a beginning, and the conservation of Park County's wildlife and natural resources is no exception. As we'll learn from today's talk, it took concerted efforts from observant citizens and officials to understand the long-term impacts of unregulated hunting and lay the groundwork for wildlife conservation in Park County. So many of the benefits that we enjoy today afforded by Wyoming's natural resources can be traced to the foresight of early era conservationists. So without further ado, please give Brian Bovet a warm welcome. Thank you, Corey. And thanks to the Draper for allowing me to speak today. And thank all of you for showing up to a public event and braving the specter of, of coronavirus. Let's all remember to wash our hands after we're done with this. My name is Brian Beauvais, and I'm the curator of the Park County Archives, and today we're going to talk about early conservation measures that were implemented locally. And I got interested in this because for the past couple years, I've been reading a lot of old hunting narratives, and this fall I gave some talks on early big game hunting in Park County. And if you were at some of those talks, you'll see that this is vaguely similar. There are there's definitely some overlap, but this is going to be very different. But when we talk about early conservation, we have to talk about hunting laws because that's really how, how early conservation gets started. And we're going to focus on, on big game because, again, that's where early conservation, early wildlife conservation starts in the entire United States. And I don't really have time to talk about fish, although that's another interesting story. And I might save that for another present presentation next year, write up a, a presentation just on fish conservation in Park County in Wyoming. And I looked at a variety of sources for this talk, and I actually compiled so much information, the hardest part of doing this was cutting out relevant information, but it gives me a lot of material to work with moving forward. Game warden annual reports are beautiful bureaucratic documents that are first published in 1895, and they discuss issues that the state is facing regarding game management, how game populations are doing, what the state is, is trying to do to overcome problems. They also talk about outfitters and wardens and all that fun stuff. The Wyoming Wildlife Magazine talks about a little bit of this in its early years. Hunting narratives are always fun to read. We have plenty of scrapbooks in the archives hunting scrapbooks. If you've read early newspapers, you know that not much goes unpublished. So every time there's a, a discussion about, about game laws or someone's caught poaching, that gets published in the newspapers. And then plenty of research files from the Park County Archives. 
So to jump into this, I tried to organize all this stuff in a chronological order, but, but I realized that so much stuff is occurring simultaneously. Uh, I'm instead going to have to start by talking about some statewide issues and how the state dealt with these broader wildlife conservation measures. And then we're going to focus on some more local themes that, that reflect issues here in Park County. And along the way, we're going to go on some, some wild tangents, but I promise you will make it through this. So the first territorial legislature in 1869 passes this absolutely worthless game law called the Act for the Protection of Game and Fish in the Wyoming Territory. And it really does nothing. All it does is limit the sale of game meat for a few months. It provides for no closed seasons. There are no hunting licenses. And there's no enforcement ability. But they wouldn't, there's nothing to enforce anyways. And all this really is is the territorial government acknowledging that Wyoming game resources are important. And at some point, they're going to have to do something about it. But they really just don't know what moves they're going to have to make yet. There aren't really, they don't really know what sort of problems they're going to be confronted with. And a few years later, a problem shows up in the form of buffalo hunters. In the 18, late 1870s, 1877, 1878, the southern buffalo herd down in Kansas, Nebraska, uh, Texas, Oklahoma is killed out by these guys. So they move up north into Wyoming, Montana, the Dakotas to hunt the remaining buffalo up here. And they're looking for buffalo hides to sell in, in industrial uses back on the East Coast. They're also looking for buffalo tongues, which are a delicacy in a lot of restaurants in, in cities in the late 1800s. And these guys are real professionals. They work with industrial efficiency. A normal buffalo hunting outfit consists of one hunter and two or three skinners. And they can process over 50 buffalo a day on a good day. And we don't really know a lot about these guys, especially the ones who hunted in the Bighorn Basin, just because they didn't leave a big paper trail. But one of them was Jim White. Jim White was a buffalo hunter down in Texas. And then he, when they're all wiped out down there, he moves up to Wyoming, hunts around the Bighorn Basin and, and southern Montana. And he's eventually shot down on Shell Creek in 1881. And then he's reburied out at Old Trail Town. But all the buffalo are hunted out of the basin pretty quickly by 1885, which is, is fast considering these guys just got here in the late 1870s. And the territory realized that this is, this is a problem. So they passed the first hunting season from August 1st to November 15th. But this only applies to market hunters. It does not limit ranchers, cowboys, and homesteaders who are living off the land. They are still free to shoot whatever they want, whenever they want to, as long as, as, long as it's, in with, it, it's within 10 miles of wherever they live, and it's going to feed them and their families. So the territory is trying to limit, subsist, uh, limit market hunting, not subsistence hunting. And then it eventually becomes a felony to kill a buffalo in Wyoming in 1895. And this is more, this is way too late, obviously, like 10 years too late. But this is just Wyoming trying to catch up with federal law and also confront the problem of poaching in Yellowstone. And the disappearance of the buffalo in Wyoming really makes a lot of local people realize that they're going to have to do something about wildlife conservation. Because for a long time, people just thought wildlife resources in America were inexhaustible. And then they watched as buffalo were exterminated. And they realized if they don't do something, all these remaining animals are going to disappear as well. And when early settlers come to the Bighorn Basin in the late 1870s, early 1880s, they come across a landscape that's just littered with buffalo bones, the work of these market hunters. And this becomes an economic opportunity in 1901 when the railroad comes to Cody. A lot of these guys, these ranchers and homesteaders, can gather up these buffalo bones and sell them back east to be ground down into fertilizer, which was a big industry in late 1800s America. So after all the buffalo are gone, 
a lot of these professional hunters just turn to general market hunting. And market hunting has, has played an important role in American history. Every time people are living on the, the edge of society, on the frontier, they need to have a, a regular food source that's not always available. And market hunters work to, to feed that, that need. And we don't really know, there wasn't a huge amount of market hunters in Park County, just because we're so far removed from centers of population, as opposed to other parts of the country. But the area that saw the most market hunting in Park County is the Sunlight Crandall area, because the early miners of Cook City had to be fed somehow, and also the early town of Red Lodge had to get some sort of food. Red Lodge is a much older town than communities in the basin. And one of these guys that we know of is Bill Grineau. And we know about him from this book, Cow Range and Hunting Trail by Malcolm McKay. Malcolm McKay was a rancher who lived on the north side of the Bear Twos, but he would come down into Clark's Fork every year to hunt bear and elk. And Bill Grineau's family homesteaded kind of the, the Crandall Creek area. And McKay says every September, Bill will start shooting animals until he can load up 20 or 30 pack horses. And then he'll ride over the Bear Twos down in a Red Lodge, sell all the meat, come back to the Clark's Fork, and do it all over again. And the point I want to make here is that this is completely legal at the time. Open season is from September 1st to December 1st. It's now illegal to kill more than two game animals in one day. I'm not sure how many people would actually abide by that law. Again, because it's not enforced, but that's the law. And it's aimed at market hunting. But it is still legal to sell game meat within the open season and a month afterwards. So, so the state, or should I say the territory, is, is trying to limit market hunting, but not entirely. It still has a role to play in, in rural Wyoming. And there are plenty of other market hunters in the history of Park County, uh, like Frank Chatfield, who was the first settler in Sunlight Basin. He was actually a market hunter feeding miners in Cook City, and he liked Sunlight Basin so much he decided to stay there. Also, Ned Frost, he talks about when his family had the stage stop out on Sage Creek, they had a lot of travelers come through, and these people need to be fed somehow. So he just goes out and shoots a pronghorn or deer to feed these people. In 1895, the state requires non-residents to purchase a license, and this is the first license for $20. And Wyoming is one of the first, but not the first, state to require licenses. I think, I think Massachusetts was the, the first state. And then in 1899, we see the biggest package of game laws to date. And this really brings Wyoming into having a, a state-regulated hunting environment and, and game management institution. The legislature creates the state game warden position. Previously, since the 1870s, there had been a fish commissioner. And for a while, the legislature tried to get him to also be responsible for game management. But he's like, no, I don't want to do that. I'm, I'm the fish commissioner. So they create this separate position. First bag limits are set at two deer, two elk, three antelope, one sheep, and one mountain goat. They pass the guide law, which requires all non-resident hunters to purchase, to hire a resident guide. And this is a result of uh, a scourge of non-resident hunters who flood into the state every year and basically just do whatever the heck they want to. And it pisses off a lot of locals. So they require that they have to hire a guide to sort of keep them in check. Now, guides existed prior to their requirement by law. Just a lot of professional hunters and market hunters would hire, their, hire themselves out as guides just because these non-resident hunters need to have someone who knows the landscape. And in order to become a guide in 1899, you just have to throw down your $10 swear that you are a resident of the state of Wyoming, swear that you're a person of good moral character, and there you go, voila, you're a guide. You don't have to get an outfitter's permit, you don't have to get a forest service special use permit, this is it. So a lot of early cowboys and ranchers and homesteaders become guides, 
This is a list of guides from Park County from 1915 State Game Warden Report. And if you're familiar with local names and local history, you probably recognize a lot of these guys like Lawrence Nordquist, A.A. Anderson, Will Richards, Jim McLaughlin of the Valley Ranch, Monty Jones, who was in charge of the TE for a while, uh, Wright Grinot, remember Bill Grinot from the Clark's Fork? His brother is now a guide. Ned Frost, Pete Nordquist, we have Snyders, we have Goffs, we have, we have Henry Purvis, we have Sam Aldrich of the South Fork, George Downing. And a lot of these guys realize that there is an economic future for those Westerners who are in a position to mediate between hunters and wildlife in this new state-regulated conservation environment. And this hunting industry also creates a need to sustain game populations for, for business. The hunting economy depends on non-resident hunters, and if there are no game to chase, then these hunters are gonna stop coming. Also, a lot of early promoters of Cody, who are often very connected with this hunting economy, realize that the economic destiny of this area really depended on the decision of Easterners to come out west and hopefully, you know, drop a little cash and invest in this new enterprise that we got going out here. Moving on, four strangers are appointed as assistant game wardens during hunting season. This is even before the state starts appointing game wardens, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Non-resident hunters have to buy a $40 license, and residents have to buy a $1 gun license, which is a hunting license, but only if they are hunting outside of the county in which they reside, so the vast majority of Wyoming residents don't have to buy a license. And this will change in 1903, when all residents are required to buy a $2 license. So this is the non-resident hunting license from 1899. You can see the season is from September 1st to December 1st. There's the bag limit, which is pretty good if you can get it. This is the resident equivalent. It's the same, except it's only a dollar. This is a, just a general license. These are all general licenses. This is Game species are yet to be split up into, into special licenses for every different kinds of animal. So you just go in and buy this general license, and this is your hunting license. And you can see that all these tags on the side here is your bag limit, and you, you tear off these little tags and send them in at the end of the season to inform the game and fish what has been harvested. In 1909, you got one elk, two deer, and one sheep. In 1911, two elk, and they're always changing the bag limits and the seasons depending on how they think game populations are doing. In 1917, they do away with the tags, and you just have to write your report on the back of the license and send it in. In 1921, now we have these different seasons for different animals, and this, this starts to get even more complicated. Now there are different seasons for different animals in different locations. Different counties have different seasons. And the small print keeps getting smaller until they can't fit all this stuff on the license. They have to print it on the back of the license or in a separate book booklet. And one of the things that you should notice here in this hunting license sequence is that antelope get dropped off the license very quickly. And that's because in the early 1900s, antelope were almost completely wiped out across the state of Wyoming, which is really hard to believe now that you drive outside of Cody and you can't not see antelope. But a lot of early homesteaders really thought nothing about popping an antelope whenever they needed a bite to eat. And the original bag limit of three antelope was, in retrospect, way too many. So. In 1908, the state just closes antelope season, lets the population recover, and they do so, but very unevenly. In southern Wyoming and eastern Wyoming, they come back much faster. So in 1915, there are a few limited licenses, and then we don't see antelope hunting in Park County again until 1927. And this is why when you look at old photos of hunting trips, you rarely see antelope because it had to either be before 1908 or after 1927. And the antelope really come back in Park County in the upper Grable Valley. And this is also where Charles Belden of the Pitchfork Ranch 
is raising antelope to sell to zoos and distribute around the country, around the world. This is the first game census in 1919 that the Game and Fish ever did. And they put a lot of these out. And if you want to see all these, I mean, I have them on my computer. So this is just one from 1919. And you can see in Park County, they are counting 300 antelope, which is pretty paltry. This is just a table of, of antelope numbers in Park County for a decade. And you can see that there is, it gets pretty low in the early 20s, and then it explodes. And I wouldn't take these numbers as, as gospel truth, because, I mean, their, their counting is funky. But you can definitely see, just there's a ballpark figure, there's an explosion of antelope in the early 1920s. And then it starts to level off in 19, going into the 30s. This is an antelope census from 1946. And we can see that they are counting 1,500 antelope in Park County. And this population is sort of centered around the east side of Carter Mountain and into the Grable. And then these are antelope hunting areas from 1946. And we can see that there is no antelope hunting in Park County or anywhere near Park County. And antelope hunting has been on special license, limited quota, and it's not a, a given thing on a regular basis in these early years. Now, moose are also interesting. Early explorers and mountain men rarely mention seeing moose in Wyoming. People think that they were, they were just a small population in the Jackson Hole area and the upper Green River, and they've slowly been expanding out ever since. And they're pretty easy for, for market hunters to find and harvest. So the moose season is closed throughout the state in 1899. It's opened again in 1915 for, what, 19 licenses for what would, in our money, be about $4,000 a piece. So you have to really want to shoot a moose. And then it's closed again in the 1920s. And moose are introduced into the bighorns in the 1920s because moose are not indigenous to the bighorns. So in the early 1900s, we see a few different kinds of, of new poaching. One is head hunting, where people just shoot animals for their trophies. And this is a result of a big demand amongst East Coast guys who want to put big heads in their dens and show them off to their friends. And a lot of these people can't come out here on these extravagant hunting trips themselves, or if they do, they don't get a big enough animal to, to, to take back home and show, show their family. So locals will often shoot these animals, these big trophy animals, and taxidermy themselves, and then sell them to vacationers and hunters to take back east. And this is a problem because you know, trophy animals are almost wiped out very quickly. There's also the issue of tusk hunting, which is more of a problem in Jackson, although it's a problem, it happens in Park County too. And this is where hunters will shoot elk, bull elk, just for their, their canine teeth, because these are sought after pieces of jewelry in the early 1900s. The Elks Club of America, their emblem are these little decorated elk teeth fobs. And eventually, the Elks Club realizes what they're doing to the remaining elk population in the United States, and they, they get rid of these. And the state makes it illegal to kill only for heads, antlers, and tusks in 1907. So there's a saying that gets thrown around in a lot of early hunting narratives that I've read, that in the early days, hunters would shoot an animal just to watch it drop, which I know sounds kind of crass, but these folks had very different ideas about nature and wildlife than we do today. And many of these people hunted for food. This is where the term pot hunter comes from, people who, who hunt for the pot, the cooking pot. They're also called game hogs, people who just hog all the game. They're greedy. And some of their behavior might seem distasteful to us today. One example, I know I'm, I'm not trying to pick on this guy, is a German hunter named Paul Nydek, who comes out to Park County in 1900, 1901 what would become Park County. And he's hunted all over the world. He writes this book about all of his hunting trips. And he tells a lot of stories about his, his experiences. One time he's hunting up Eagle Creek 
and he's headed back to camp for the night, and he comes across an elk, and he shoots this elk, and he mortally wounds it, but it doesn't die right away. It runs off in the opposite direction from where he needs to go back to camp, and he's like, oh, I'm tired, you know, it's been a long day, I'm not gonna recover this. And this is a normal, this is a normal thing when you read a lot of hunting narratives. If, if the animal isn't just right there for these hunters, then that's too bad. There's also another story where he's in the thoroughfare and he comes across a big herd of elk and he just starts shooting into this herd indiscriminately, not at any one animal, and he probably puts three, 30 or 40 rounds into this herd and three of the animals drop and who knows how many run off wounded to die somewhere else, but he's very happy that he got these three elk and he doesn't really try to recover anything else. And again, I'm not trying to pick on this guy because he's one of many. This was just a very common idea about hunting at the time. Now simultaneously with, with this form of hunting, there are hunters in the late 1800s, there's a growing sensibility amongst a lot of wealthy hunters on the East Coast that they are witnessing a national decline in game populations and something needs to be done. And this results in groups like the Boone and Crockett Club and the Campfire Club forming to, to work for national wildlife conservation policies and to protect game as, as public property for all people. They lobby for game laws and tighter enforcement of these game laws. They work to instill hunting ethics and sportsmanship into these laws so that, that the laws might serve to combat poachers and market hunters and pot hunters to preserve game for true sportsmen. And there's definitely a degree of, of social class dynamics and elitism in this new push to encode sportsmanship into law. Because a lot of rural Westerners do not hunt for, for as a leisure activity, and as opposed to East Coast Boone and Crockett Club members who, who go hunting as a form of, of recreation. And I love this illustration from a William Hornaday book where we have the different types of hunters. You can see the very restrained, dignified sportsmen right up front here. Over on the right, we have pot hunters. There are immigrants who shoot songbirds, which a lot of sportsmen feel is, is unethical. Over here, we have market hunters and these guys who use automatic and pump guns and you can see that they're, they're sort of fat and disheveled and they have cars and they're, which, which the implication is that they're lazy hunters. This guy's drunk. And this culture of sportsmanship runs very counter to our local culture of meat hunting out here in the rural west where, where people live, have been living very close to the land. They, they often live off the land and there's a great deal of sympathy for people who need to hunt for food. And a great example of this is a story told by A.A. A. Anderson. He was the first superintendent of the Yellowstone Forest Reserve. He was also an, an artist from New York City. He was kind of a New York aristocrat. He spent a lot of time in Paris with that art community. And he had a ranch on the Upper Grable. And he tells the story that one day he's riding on the Upper Grable with some forest rangers in midsummer. And when they meet a man with a freshly killed deer out of season. So they arrest the guy, they take him to the local judge. Anderson doesn't say who the judge is, it's probably Otto Frank. And they proceed to lay out charges, and it's pretty obvious this guy was poaching as they caught the guy red-handed. And they have a jury of local cowboys. And the jury won't find this guy guilty because they say he needed the meat. And Anderson is, is frankly kind of flabbergasted by this and kind of frustrated because he's one of the few people in, in Park County that's trying to implement wildlife conservation policies. But how can he do this? How can he protect local wildlife when the local population is clearly not on board? And A.A. Anderson was not the only local resident concerned with enforcing game laws. Back in 1887, a few ranchers on the Upper Grable created the Wyoming Game Protective Association as a way to protect local animals 
and enforce law, laws. It was founded by Colonel Pickett, who was a, a veteran of the Civil War. He fought for the Confederacy. I think his cousin was the Pickett Charge guy. Archibald Rogers, he and his friend Thomas Payton owned the Bar TL Ranch on the Grable. And Colonel Pickett and Archibald Rogers and Thomas Payton are all members of the, they're charter members of the Boone and Crockett Club. So these guys are very well connected. They, they know how to get things done in terms of enforcing game laws. This is the, the Boone and Crockett Club Constitution. And then we have Otto Frank, who was a local rancher on the Pitchfork in the Grable. And he was also the Justice of the Peace, so he could lend a little bit of, of legal backing to this organization. And Otto Frank writes this great letter to the Billings Gazette back in 1899, talking all about the, the Wyoming Game Protective Association and how it formed to stop the slaughter of local game from so-called sportsmen and these market hunters. He also says that non-residents are not allowed to go hunting in Wyoming. And this is really weird because that's patently false. We've gone over game laws and they can certainly go hunting in Wyoming. And I don't really know why he says this, but I think he says it because these guys just don't want people hunting in their neck of the woods. A.A. A. Anderson tells a story of coming down to Wyoming on a hunting trip in the 1890s. And he actually has dinner with Colonel Pickett, which probably was pretty awkward to have a, a Confederate veteran and a, a New York Yankee sit down. And as Anderson's leaving, Pickett tells him that he can't go hunting up the Grable because it's illegal for, for non-residents to go hunting in Wyoming. He says if he wants to go hunting, he has to go over to the stinking water. And Anderson says, well, you know that's in Wyoming too. And Pickett's like, well, blah, 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 blah. He doesn't really have a, respon he doesn't really have a response for it. In, anyway, Anderson, being a New York aristocrat, is not used to being bossed around, especially by someone who lost the Civil War. So he goes up the Grable anyway, and Pickett sends one of his game wardens after him to try to trip him up. But the point of this story is that a lot of early wildlife conservation is very self-interested wildlife conservation. Sure, Pickett wanted to enforce game laws because he saw the local game herds as, as being his personal property. We also know about the Game Protective Association from a hunting trip told by a story told by William Hornaday, who publishes this in, in Scribner's Magazine. He comes down hunting around Cody in 1889 with some military men from, from Montana. And they go hunting around McCullough Peaks and Rattlesnake Mountain. This is a picture of, of Cedar Mountain. They're up on top of Rattlesnake looking, looking south. This is the confluence of the North Fork and South Fork. Hornaday shoots a sheep up on Rattlesnake Mountain. One of his Indian guides actually shoots a sheep in McCullough Peaks, back when there were sheep in McCullough Peaks. And the hunting party encounters one of, these, one of these game constables employed by the Game Protective Association. And he tells them that they don't have a license and they're violating local game laws by being here. And after they have a little powwow, they agree that the hunting party can stay, but only as long as only Hornaday and the officers do the hunting. The enlisted men and the Indians can't do any hunting. So the joke here that is again that in 1899 you don't need a license and these guys are hunting within the season so they're perfectly legal and they don't know that. But again you have to wonder about the intentions of the Wyoming Game Protective Association and their constables. For whom are they actually protecting this wildlife? So the Game Protective Association exists in Wyoming because Wyoming really has no way to enforce its, its meager game laws. In the 1890s, county commissioners are allowed to appoint local game wardens, but these aren't paid positions, so these guys really don't do anything. They're worthless. In 1902, the state game warden can finally appoint assistant game wardens across the state, 
and he appoints a couple of them every now and again. There's really not too many. And this is when we really have the first salaried, semi-professional wardens in Wyoming. And our first game warden here in Park County is a guy by the name of O.D. Marks. He came to Cody to run the Cody Hotel, which was the first hotel in Cody. It was down by where the Silver Dollar patio is. He also homesteaded a ranch on the South Fork by Deer Creek, and he ran it as a early dude ranch and hunting outpost. And I don't have time to talk about all these game wardens. Again, that maybe that's another, a topic for another presentation. But a lot of these guys are, are people connected with this dude ranching and outfitting industry here in Park County. So the Game Protective Association eventually dissolves. Pickett moves back to Kentucky in 1904. Otto Frank dies. And Archibald Rogers and Thomas Payton sell their ranch on the Grey Bull in the 1890s. And the next local organization formed to take up wildlife conservation is the Cody Club, which was founded in 1900 as a local hunting club. When local leaders realized that, that big game hunting was important to the local economy, and they were concerned about protecting this vanishing wildlife for wealthy, wealthy hunters. And these hunters, they, they hoped that they would come out west on hunting vacations and invest capital into the Bighorn Basin. And the Cody Club worked to lobby for game laws, enforce those laws, and also worked to increase game manage, management of local wildlife as public property, available to residents and paying non-resident hunters alike. Now after the, the Cody Club starts to take on more of a Chamber of Commerce type function, we have another local group, the Cody Rod and Gun Club, which eventually becomes the Park County Rod and Gun Club. And they take up the task of promoting local wildlife conservation. They lobby for game laws. They make recommendations to the Wyoming legislature and game and fish. They're very active in planting fish and game birds around Park County. They suggest introducing mountain goats into the Absorcas, but Montana beat them to it when they introduced mountain goats into the Bear Twos. They work hard to lobby the state and the Forest Service to decrease grazing permits on winter range and migration corridors. And we have a list here of early members, which again, if you're familiar with local history, this is kind of a, a who's who of local leaders in, in Park County, in Cody, male leaders. I mean, we don't have time to talk about all these, but I want to focus on one, Larry Larum, who started the Valley Ranch on the South Fork in about 1917, and he was always very active in local matters of wildlife conservation. He worked with Game and Fish about management decisions. He's really interested in preserving game on the South Fork because his dude ranch, his dude guests, want to vacation in a western landscape that is populated by this large game. And Larum is smart enough to know what he's selling, and he knows that if all these animals are wiped out, then a lot of his customers would be much less satisfied with their, their dude ranch experience. And all this is indicative of a increasing acceptance of sportsmanship and game laws throughout Park County. We see more people joining these clubs, actively participating in local wildlife conservation, and taking wildlife conservation seriously. But old habits really die hard. And the larger conservation movement changed what had been, for a long time, acceptable practice into criminal behavior. Types of hunting are now considered poaching. And I'll hope, I hope you'll understand here that, that everyone doesn't buy into this redefinition right away. A lot of people take a very long time. And some people, even today, just never really buy into this redefinition. Settlers who are used to pot hunting, hunting for food, are now demonized by the growing ranks of sportsmen as being wasteful and greedy. The local outfitting community in Park County, who is very connected with the East Coast sportsman establishment, begins to express this same hostility towards pot hunting, which they claim is unsportsmanlike. And local, the local hunting industry of guides and outfitters also establish a preferred type of local hunting. And this is going on pack trips 
into the back country to find once in a lifetime trophy animals. And this is the type of hunting that wealthy East Coast hunters want to experience when they're out west, and it's what the local outfitting community has come to provide. And this debate about what is and isn't sportsmanlike becomes a real issue when cars become readily available for, for regular people. And people are no longer, no longer required to go on these big month-long pack trips to reach game animals because roads and automobile travel opens up a lot of areas that were previously closed off and much more remote. And a lot of local guides and sportsmen argue that hunting should be banned in places with automobile access. And they're mainly talking about winter range, where game bunches up in big groups and can be easily found and easily hunted. And there's a big debate in Park County about whether or not this practice should be legal. People who utilize game meat as food think it's great because they can secure winter meat relatively easily. At the same time, a lot of people in the local outfitting community argue that seasons should be drastically shorted, shortened and hunters should be required to go up in the mountains to hunt animals on their summer range. And this whole question of where it should be legal and illegal to hunt results in a system of game preserves that are meant to protect winter range and, and migration corridors without totally blocking out hunting access. Now Buffalo Bill actually tried to lease state land for his own game preserve on the South Fork for his hunting club back in 1896 because he saw that this wildlife conservation thing was, was growing in popularity and he wants to get on the bandwagon. But the state engineer uh, Elward Mead denies him of this request because he thought he was just going to have his own private hunting club for him and his, his East Coast cronies, which he probably was going to do. Anderson, A.A. Anderson, tries to designate informal game preserves on the National Forest because to his credit, he sees that wildlife needs dependable winter range. And he actually tries to kick homesteaders out of the Sunlight Basin and the Upper South Fork because he wants to turn these areas into game preserves. He also designates the mountains around his ranch as a game preserve, which must have been very convenient. But the state of Wyoming ends up designating game preserves itself. In 1905, the first game preserve on the south side of Yellowstone is, is put in place to protect the, the migration of the Yellowstone elk herd. And then George Beck, one of our town founders, is elected to the state senate in 1912. And he gets put on the state game management committee. And he draws up these these local game preserves, the Hoodoo, the Shoshone, and the Boulder Basin here in Park County. And these are a means of protecting winter habitat and providing a protective buffer around Yellowstone. In a lot of these early years, there's always murmurs of trying to expand the boundaries of Yellowstone, and these game preserves are a way to sort of silence that, that debate. And these are in place, the hunting preserve system in Wyoming is in place until 1947 when game management units are introduced. This is a map from 1916 of Park County and the park. And we can see that there's the Hoodoo Game Preserve up here on the northeast side. There's the Shoshone State Game Preserve between the South Fork and the North Fork. And then the Boulder Basin Game Preserve down here between the South Fork and the Grable. And these eventually get expanded out to include a lot more space. We see here that the thoroughfare is now in a game preserve, which probably pissed off a lot of outfitters. And the North Fork is now entirely en encompassed by a game preserve, so there's really no hunting on the North Fork anymore. And this is all about trying to stop automobile hunting in the late season. These are original, the original Wyoming hunting units put in place in 1947. Now, hunting units are a much better way of strategically distributing hunters across the landscape, as opposed to just having big blocks of land that are entirely blocked off to hunting, which then concentrates hunters in other areas. 
And that's where we eventually get our, our hunting units that we're familiar with today. These are elk hunting areas from 1965. So when we, when we talk about early wildlife conservation, we can't just talk about hunting laws and game preserves and, and sportsmanship. We also have to talk about a couple topics that might not be as agreeable to our modern sensibility. And the first is predator extermination, which until very recently was really considered common sense, the first principle of wildlife conservation. If you want to know all about local predator extermination in Park County in the Bighorn Basin, you have to read Calvin Kigg's book. He says that wolves are killed out of, out of Park County by 1917. The state of Wyoming hired trappers and paid bounty hunters. The local government did the same. Park County did the same. Ranchers associations hired trappers and predator hunters. And there was really a concerted effort to eliminate predators for the purpose of wildlife conservation. And we might not think of this as, as wildlife conservation, but in the past it was just common sense. In order to increase game and protect game, you killed predators. Now Ned Frost, whom we've talked about before, in his later life admits that he was, he was a bit of a game hog, and he regrets this because he's, his sentiments have changed regarding sportsmanship and conservation. And he admits that he, he did kill a lot of game wastefully in his younger years. But he also says in his defense that he also killed a lot of predators. And in doing so, he protected a lot of big game. And I'm not saying this to pick on Ned Frost. He's just expressing an opinion that was very common at the time. The last thing I want to address is the topic of Indian exclusion. And I don't think this gets talked about very much, especially in terms of the conservation movement. And let's just focus on the Crow tribe here for a second. In the 1851 Treaty of Fort Laramie, the US government designates this big area of southern Montana and northwest Wyoming as the, the Crow Reservation. This goes all the way over to Livingston, Montana. We have areas over here into what would become Yellowstone, all the way down in the Wind River, down to Lander, all the Bighorn Basin, all the Bighorns. Now when Wyoming is trying to become a territory in 1868, the US government convinces the Crow to give up all of this area down here. And then they have the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie, there's way too many treaties of Fort Laramie, that stipulated that the Crow will give up this big area down here, although they will maintain their hunting rights on their former reservation on unoccupied lands. And if you follow Supreme Court news, you know that this was the subject of a recent de decision about a year ago, where some guys were hunting over in the Bighorns from the Crow tribe, and they got charged with poaching. And they said, no, 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 we're not poaching. We have this, this 1868 treaty. And the Supreme Court agreed with them. Now, this recent Supreme Court decision overturned a previous Supreme Court decision from, from 1896 called Ward versus Racehorse. Racehorse was a Bannock Indian who was hunting in Jackson Hole. And in 1860, 1896, the US Supreme Court found that when Wyoming became a state, all previous Indian treaties were nullified and Wyoming had the right to manage its game laws however it saw fit. So this is an issue that's going to be in the court for years to come, trying to decide what exactly are unoccupied lands in 2020 Wyoming. But to bring this back to history, when A.A. A. Anderson is in charge of the Forest Service, he's trying to implement a lot of these wildlife conservation policies. And he's frustrated because, because Indians keep coming into the Bighorn Basin and, and hunting whenever, whenever they feel like it. So he writes the Bureau of Indian Affairs in DC to request that Indians are not permitted to leave their reservations to hunt anymore. He's like, we're, you know, we're trying, to, we're trying to do conservation here. We can't do this if these Indians are just hunting whenever they feel like it. And I want to be very clear here that this is ostensibly done as part of the campaign to protect local wildlife. 
So to wrap things up, how should we talk about early conservation in Park County? What sort of story should we tell? It is true that wealthy sportsmen did sometimes impose their ideas of sportsmanship and what did and did not constitute poaching. And a lot of local people in the rural west didn't really vibe very well with this. And many early wildlife conservation policies did work against local hunters who operated in the rural tradition of living off the land. But Park County residents willingly supported wildlife conservation when they had some stake in the survival of game resources. Think here about outfitters and guides and dude ranchers and community leaders who, who wanted wealthy hunt hunters to come out west and maybe invest some money. And by defining wildlife as a public resource, conservationists could deflect charges that they were, in, to some degree, throwing local subsistence hunters under the bus in order to create a playground for rich people to recreate. And as I've tried to, to make clear here, as local game populations declined throughout the West, local pot hunters faced off against wealthy sportsmen and their local allies, who demanded government regulation of hunting before it was all gone. And by defining market hunting as greedy and year-round subsistence hunting as wasteful, sportsmen conservationists secured laws to enforce their own ideas of proper hunting against local game hogs and, and pot hunters. And I think what often gets left out of the history of wildlife conservation is the fact that this debate ever really happened at all, especially not on a local level and especially here in Park County. So with that being said, I should thank the Matitsa Museums and the Kraken Research Library for helping me out with some research. I should also thank Bob Richard, who was nice enough to sit down with me and talk about early outfitting. And I also need to thank the, the, uh, the head librarian here, here in Cody, who helped me out interlibrary, loan, lo interlibrary loaning a great deal of research that was not available locally. So thank you very much.